go ahead. I'm sorry, Heather, okay. jumping up. So basically what we're trying to do is some of you, especially people back east or Midwest, have not been to a roundup. You have not been to a sale facility or an auction or any of these things that happen out west in these capture pens and in the the long-term holding, the short-term holding. So this is what we're going to be talking about today, what happens after the roundup. And we're going to go through these things one at a time. But I'm going to flip through some of these slides very quickly just for time uh, capture. And the first thing we're going to talk about, whoops, is the capture pens. And this is the West Douglas capture pen. We've heard a lot about West Douglas this week because of the horses at Canyon City. These are the horses that you're seeing that are going into this trap that are getting sick and dying at Kansas City. Can Canyon City, sorry. And this is what the trap looked like. They allowed me to go up and look at the trap before they started, but they did not allow me to be anywhere close during the roundup. So that's the trap. And this is where I had to watch it from. Well over a mile away, had to find a, a peekaboo spot in the in the for in the shrubbery in the trees to be able to look down. The capture site is way down here, and that's that's the view I had. Um, and I don't have a camera like these wonderful photographers. I have a 40x zoom on my little Canon shot. And so this is the this is the trap site. What you see down here is the Judas horse uh, waiting for the horses to come in. The helicopter was usually gone for about an hour, going way out and then bringing the horses back in. And I know I'm supposed to be talking about what happens after the roundup, but I think the capture pins are kind of after the yep. the active roundup. And here you see the horses running into the. If you actually, this might be, I think this is the one where the horses avoided it and ran up the hill, uh, but they were captured later. So there they go into a trap. And these are the guys up there just pushing the horses through and trying to sort them. These were a little bit smaller bands. These weren't the, the 40 horses coming in at one time. These were a band at a time and they would go into that trap and then bring the trailer and load them up. At the West Douglas Roundup, they did not allow us to go down and see the horses after they were removed. Sometimes at a Roundup, the next one I'm gonna show you is Santa Wash. Sometimes at a Roundup, they let you go down and look at the horses after they've sorted them. Uh, at West Douglas, they had the sorting or the holding uh, sites on private land so that we were not allowed to go. I think they did that intentionally uh, so that we would not have access to see what happened to them after they were hauled away in, this, in their trailers and there they go. And there you see Freedom Lost, the horses looking out, what's happening. We don't know what's happening to us. This is Sam Wash Basin. This, we had no access to seeing horses coming in at all. From our vantage point uh, over a mile away, all we could see was this last bit of the horses running into the trap. And again, we were so far away. I somehow got this photo with my little 40X zoom because usually I don't, ha I don't have a tripod, so I'm just, you know, it usually comes out shaky. But here is the guy up here with his flag uh, waiting to speed the horses into the trap. And there they go. And there you see how smashed in they are at the capture site. This is right after they've run for over 10 miles at a gallop at this roundup at San Wash. Little foals were left behind. Uh, and because this is a couture roundup and they gallop them for many miles. And this is one of the things that I mentioned in my 
comments the other day, both my written comments and my oral comments about the helicopter roundups, I said, this is not a, 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 a chase from point A to point B. These horses zigzag back and forth. They double back, they go around. They, they said, oh yeah, well our starting point's only eight miles away. Those horses had to have run well over 10, 12, 15 miles even because they're going back and forth and trying to escape this crazy metal bird in the air that's chasing them. And this is not nice, smooth country. This is rocky. They have something called chute there that, that slices tires open of the, of the trucks. So they, these horses are running over horrible up and down ground and rocks and everything. And after all that, they're smashed in there like that. So that is, there they are smashed in. And again, this is from a long angle from a mile away and the guys with his little flags. And these are the Couture Livestock Company helicopter contractors. It's not always the BLM guys that are, are moving the horses around. The helicopter contracts, contractors, the Coutures in this case, are the ones down there moving the horses and they're not necessarily gentle. This is when we were allowed to go down and see the horses that had been sorted into groups yeah. of- Is that temporary holding or is that still the trap site? This is the, still the trap site. Okay. This is when we were allowed to go down and look at them because at San Wash Basin, the San Wash advocacy team had been told, they, they somehow managed to work with the BLM, the local BLM to choose 50 horses to release. 25 mares, 25 stallions. So out of all the horses that they gathered up, they were allowed to release only 50. And so the Sand Wash Advocacy Team has studied these horses, photographed these horses, documented these horses. They all have names. And so they were trying to preserve genetic lines by the horses they, they saved. And you can imagine what an emotional project, a process that was for them. It's like, how do you choose your children? And they had to, they had to somehow stone themselves and look for genetic lines instead of their favorites. And it was very tough. And you see these horses, they're just confused. What's happened? Where am I? And there's a tiny little foal in there. That, that foal is not very old, you can tell. It's just been run well over 10 miles. And in this roundup, there were at least three foals left behind. I don't know if you guys heard about the case of Merlin, the stallion who found yes. the foal out miles from the trap. And Merlin, the stallion, it wasn't even his band member, brought this little foal to the trap site looking for his mother. His mother had already shipped out. So the little foal was named Stella Luna and she went to the, uh, a sanctuary where she was given milk supplement. So this is the chute, the loading chute for you to see how they load these horses into the trailer, very narrow. And of course, this is the sign that says, do not enter, this is Couture, livestock employees only and BLM. So the sorting pens, uh, they're not usually open to the public during sorting because of course that's where a lot of bad things happen. There's no transparency during sorting. It's often done on private land. They're sorted by gender, age, and there is if they're already weaned, they separate the young, the youngsters. Well, if they believe that they're yeah, ready exactly. To be, <laughs> they're right? not it's weaned. not necessarily has the mother weaned this baby. It's the BLM says, oh, that one's big enough. Let's wean it and separate. So they're sorted by gender and age. The young foals are are kept with mares, 
except when separated accidentally like Stella Luna. And by the way, Merlin jumped the fence and escaped, mm -hmm. even though he brought that little baby back. He, um, he, did get away. he did get captured. He sacrificed his safety to bring his the little soul back, but he did jump the fence and get away. He's still out there. <laughs> All right, off-range corrals are the small, uh, are the facilities where the horses go after their, their capture. So these are, uh, this is the Litchfield, California off-range corral, and this is a BLM, I'm not sure how to start the video. This is just a BLM's ex explanation about how they sort. This is a BLM video, so take it as. <laughs> We're here at the Litchfield Corral, just outside of Coolville, Northern California, Law Enforcement Bureau Recovery Facility. We're going to show you around the facility today. I'm not sure how to get that on. Law Enforcement Bureau that we have inside, and that will be available for about two weeks. Thank you. As you can see, she's very pleasant, she's very nice, she's a BLM PR person and very friendly and oh this is the, the pen where these go, this is the pen where these so separate them by this, this uh, process and it's all very nicey nicey and you do not see the bad stuff. But it is an explanation, it's an explanatory type of a, of a way to say how they sort the, 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 the horses. We're here at the house, just outside of Coolville, Northern Not working. It's not, I don't know why that's turned on. We're going to show you around the facility today. I've done the volume. That's okay, we can just skip it. But I have a couple more later. But. So there's the difference between short-term holding and long-term holding we've heard a little bit about. The short-term holding is, is we, we usually call it short-term holding. BLM calls it off-range corrals, or ORC. And typically it's the first stop they have after they've been captured and sorted preliminarily. Most of these short-term holdings are just basically feedlots. They are pens with a high density number of animals per pen. Most of these facilities have no shelter from heat, snow, sleet, rain, hail. They're out there in all conditions, stuck together in this pen when out in the wild they can go find their shelter, they can find their forage, they can find what they need. They've done this for centuries. They are now stuck in this feedlot with no shelter. Um, the cleaning of the pens is minimal. If they know a reporter is coming out, or this is why some of these places you have to go by appointment. If, if it's a some kind of important person appointment, they're gonna clean the pens. But if otherwise, and you'll see later some of them. This is also where the stallions are gelded. Uh, that's where they are all processed and vaccinated, which we just talked about, <laughs> whether it happens or not. Uh, this is where they're dewormed, supposedly freeze marked. They're definitely freeze marked and they are definitely gelded and the rest of this stuff is supposed to happen. Uh, they're tested for Coggins and they're aged by, guess what? Bulls are weaned when the bale on the sides they're ready. 
Some of the off-range trails are open to the public. Some are only open on specific days. Some are just like prison, uh, some are in prison facilities like Canyon City. And, and in, when they are in the prison facilities, it's very minimal visitation and by appointment. <coughs> when I went to Can, uh, Canyon City, I had to go through a process of background check and make sure I was approved. Um, <coughs> animals may be directly adopted from short-term holding under certain conditions. Uh, and the term short-term is misleading as some FOIA requests have shown some of the animals have been in these pens for a year or more. And here's some examples. Just because some of you may have never seen a short-term holding pen, uh, these are some examples. This is the Boise Wild Horse Corral. Uh, the day we visited coincided with the BLM National Wild Horse Advisory Board meeting uh, and the tours. So the pens were relatively clean. These pens, uh, you can imagine the advisory board is there. They want to make a good show, right? So from the BLM website about the Boise corrals, the wild horses and sometimes a few burrows are on 101,000 square feet of corral space. This is how the BLM tries to make it look like a huge space because 1,001, 101,000 square feet is only 2.3 acres. Sounds big when you say it by feet, right? Yeah. <laughs> 2.3 acres for all those horses. Um, due to facility capacity and adoption preps, the corrals are only open for walk-in adoptions on specific days. No individual appointments are taken at this time. This is probably during COVID. Walk-in adoption days are first come, first served. April 23rd was one of them from 10 to 4. And then they have pickup for trainer incentive program to tip trainers on that same day. And then they said check back for later updates for a slot. This is, these are photos from the Boise corrals. <coughs> these horses have, are, they kind of tend to clump together, stick together for security. Horses are herd animals, right? They stick together for, for comfort and for safety. And uh, yeah, these are the clean pens. <laughs> and these, are, these are some beautiful animals in this pen. And then here's one that's just about ready to give up. Uh, it's sad to see these. If any of you know Charlotte Rowe, this is her trying to give some comfort to these animals. Uh, and again, this, it's basically a dry lot pen, a feed lot pen, and there's the trough that they eat from. And this is, this is what it looks like. No shelter, open skies. They're subject to whatever weather comes around. These are buddies trying to comfort each other and look at what's right across the road. This is that pen. And then this is the burrow pen. Sweet little babies. And again, there's the, the clean pen, right? Relatively clean pens. Can you imagine what they would look like? if there wasn't a planned visit by stakeholders. And this is another long range view of the facility. There's another horse in despair. And then here's the concrete slab, a slab that they have to stand on. The concrete slab does minimize waste because you know horses when they drop in the dirt and then step in it, they can drop it here and still eat it. But they're standing on a like that. They're looking out. Uh, these kind of pictures get me when they look at you. It's looking for help. 
we informed Ms. Beal and Stafford, who was giving us the tour, that this baby was being choked. Bag is so hot. Good grown. Because they're rounded up as babies, do they ever go back and check if that tag is strangling them? So we told her this baby has grown. It, the tag was been strangling him. And so she got up there and cut it off. Or to loosen it. And there she there she is right there loosening that tag. Babies grow. And then here's the industrial rock mining site across the road. And a lot of truck and machinery traffic continually goes by, stirring up lots of dust and lots of noise. Not a very natural, not a very conducive environment for these animals. And then this horse we saw at the end of our tour, Clubfoot, we were told he was going to be euthanized that day. Euthanize is supposed to be a word that we use when there's no hope and an animal is suffering. This animal was doing fine out of the range and this club foot was exasperated by the roundup. So but they were going to put that horse down. They were going to shoot it later in the day. Palomino Valley Wild Horse and Burrow Center uh, this is also information from the BLM w uh, website. It's the largest BLM prep and adoption facility in the country. This is in Nevada, outside the Reno area. It serves as the primary preparation center for wild horses and burros gathered from the public lands in Nevada and nearby states. It is open to the public six days a week. That's one good thing about it. It's open to the public, and we'll see why in a minute. Uh, appointments are for view for viewing adoptions are limited to a maximum of one hour. So if you want to adopt a horse, you've got an hour to go through there and see which animal might speak to you. Uh, the majority are available for adoption. However, some animals may not be immediately available if they have not completed the uh, adoption prep process approximately 20 miles north of Reno Sparks, Nevada. The photos taken in this section, including the amazing photos of a stallion fight, I see they print it all out up here, uh, were taken by Mary Fiaffi. She's the president of the Pine Knot Wild Horse Advocacy Group. If any of you follow them on Facebook, they put out the most amazing photos and stories of these families and families. So she, uh, she always has given me full, full um, acceptable to use her, 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 her photos. Um, these horses are well known and well loved by their community. Prior to their capture, these are the horses that we're going to see in these slides. This is the Palomino holding facility. You can see there's a lot of horses there. Horses have to lay down and rest in the muck. Ankle deep in muck, and the horses, you can see, are just covered in it. Covered. They gild these horses in this muck mm. and put them back up. These are a couple of the Pine Nut uh, Fish Springs horses trying to get comfort from each other in these filthy conditions. This is Samson, son of the famous Bloom, who was captured. A muck-covered foal. This is Jet, and this is Samson. They were brothers on the range. They always kept their bands right together. It was almost like Samson was lead stallion and Jet was satellite stallion, but they each had their own mares. They were brothers, they constantly stick together. They were sons of, of Blue from the Pine, from the uh, Fish Springs Ranch. Again, look at this, this nastiness. These are the stallions sticking together. 
some of them to see why he didn't want any part of it. Oh, and this was Jet's mare and baby. Uh, this is baby Hayden and Jet's mare Scarlet, and this is the bachelor who saved them after Jet got into the trap with his brother and his family. So Scarlet and Hayden are outside this tra trap, and they were they were they were calling to Jet in the trap. They were full. Jet and Scarlet were just calling and screaming, trying to figure out how to get back together again. And then they were saved by the bachelor stallion who came down and led them away. However, they returned every day to, for days after the trap was empty, looking for Jet. They, uh, the advocates had to keep chasing them back, otherwise they would have gotten trapped too. This is them out on the range before the trap. You can see the bonds, the family bonds, the loving bonds. This is Scarlet, this is Baby Hayden, this is Jet. This is why they were screaming for each other, right? And some more. There they are, standing in the filth. Covered in a mixture of mud, muck, and urine. The glorious Samson, covered in filth. These are Samson and, Ro Samson and Rocky. Samson's a beautiful bay roan. Uh, Rocky another beautiful stallion who was captured. They knew each other on the range, so they're friendly in here. And this is Rocky, covered in filth. And some of the mares. Rocky, swollen and bloodied after gelding. It's difficult to heal from a procedure like that when you're stuck in a pen that's so filled with muck and urine. And now here is the beginning of the stallion fight. Mary, the Pine Nut Wells Horse Advocate Fee Group and their community loved these horses so much and they were trapped <laughs> because a, a planning commissioner who lived there wanted, wanted them gone. He wanted them gone. They were coming into his yard. Nevada is a fence out state. That means if you don't want animals in your yard, you are responsible for fencing them out. The Pine Nut Wild Horse Advocacy Group raised money and said, look, we'll build the fences for you to keep them out of your neighborhood. And they say, no, we don't want a fence. And the guy's, the guy's neighbor next to him fed the horses put water out, put hay out, because he liked seeing them come into his yard. But his neighbor didn't like it, so he called the BLM, and then they're considered nuisance horses. And so the BLM set up a secret trap that the Pine Nut Wild Horse Advocates could not, did not know about. They set up a secret trap and captured 21 of these beautiful animals. And it's a small herd, everyone was there. So this is Shadow. Very small stallion, but very feisty. He had his own mares, and his mares are across the fence on this side of him. And these boys were getting too close, and Shadow said, no, stay away from my mares. And there he is warning the boys to stay away from his girls. And Rocky said, you can't tell me what to do. <laughs> fight is on. Little Shadow and Bigger Rocky. And it went on for a long time. Mary took these amazing pictures. Here are these stallions covered in muck, fighting back and forth. And here's, <laughs> here's little Jet going, staying out of it. Just watch him. And, and there they go down. So that is Jet watching while Rocky and Shadow continue their fight, and it just goes on and on and on and on. 
was just, I, I work for In Defense of Animals. I am the Wild Person Borough Project, uh, Campaign Director for In Defense of Animals. And this is just a story. Uh, I write these blogs uh, two or three times a month. And this was the story that I wrote about this uh, on our In Defense of Animals page saying, please contact the BLM and, and ask them to clean up conditions in Canyon City. So that's just the rest of the story. Oops, sorry. I didn't know all this stuff was going to come up. I'll go backwards. As I said, I think you need to go to the DC presentation. Where is that now? Where you want to be? Across the top, you see right there the DC presentation. Oh. Is that where you want to be? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> I'm not real tech savvy here. <laughs> so then, after Carol Walker and I and Claire Staples at Sky Dog were trying to expose the story about these horses that were in such horrible condition at Canyon, Canyon City. Carol wrote me that, oops. Carol wrote me this letter, uh, this email. She said, hi, Ginger, I just got this response now after nine letters to Biden last year. And you can see, dear Miss Walker, blah, blah, blah. We also understand that you have since received a response 
to the FOIA request you referred to in your letter, including 18 pages of responses record. Regarding your request to ease access restrictions to the Canyon City Off-Range Corral, may we remind you that access to that facility is governed by the Colorado Department of Corrections, CEDA. And as you know, CEDA also restricts photography within the facility. Well, this is the transparency we all know and love that BLM likes to hide behind. So that's their letter after FOIA requests and letters to the president, letters, Tom, Carol is relentless. Carol Walker, you know, she is relentless. She will go after them. And then almost immediately after she got this letter, guess what? She got communication from Canyon City that Steve Leonard himself coming out to do the compliance check on her horse that she had adopted that fall. Mm -hmm. And so Ginger Catherine's and I went to Carol's home to be with her for Steve's visit. She wanted, she was scared. She said, can they take them away from me? And, and we said, no, they're doing everything right, but she, she wanted backup. Ginger Catherine, pardon me? Oh yeah, oh absolutely. It was intimidation. Yeah. So so we went to her home and, and were there during the visit. Uh, and, and a little fact, I personally have been certified to do compliance checks for the BOM. I've been certified for quite a while. I have never, ever been asked to do that. So I very politely and curiously just wonder why this is, asked Steve Le Leonard, I live about 20 minutes away from here, why didn't somebody call me and ask me to do this compliance check? They didn't know that I was friends with her. <laughs> um, and he just replied, oh, they need to do a better job of using their volunteers. So uh, it's just, it was pure intimidation. And, and Ginger Catherine knows Steve Leonard. She gets along with him because she understands that you have to have kind of a copacetic relationship. So, so she and I were both talking to him friendly, even though I had just written that awful article and said, investigate Steve Leonard. <laughs> And now, 95 now, and counting dead horses in six days. This is what happens. We try, we try, we try. So this is what I just pulled from articles last night. Oops, I keep hitting the wrong button. Um, BLM Director of Communications, Stephen Hall, was quoted as saying, they came from talking about these West Douglas horses. They came from a very challenging landscape. It's actually an area the BLM has determined is not suitable for wild horses. And a lot of those horses were gathered with, with which means these horses, when they came into our care, oftentimes had health issues. Oh my goodness, what the biggest lie. These, these horses were not gathered because they were in unsuitable conditions. Those horses have lived there for centuries and they are healthy. They were gathered because this West Douglas area was supposedly a zeroed out area years ago. They supposedly zeroed them out. Guess what, they missed a few. And now there were too many for them. And why were they zeroed out? Oh sheep ranchers wanted the area. So that's that's just a bold faced lie. They did not come in with health issues. You saw, I was at the capture site. I saw them rounding up those horses. They, these horses come in with healthy body scores, healthy condition, and then they're thrown into places like Canyon City where they get sick. And those horses, okay, here's another quote. Uh, BLM 
acting associate state director, Van Gruber says, this tragic outcome was influenced by a population of horses that may have been particularly vulnerable given their time in the West Douglas area and their exposure to last year's wildfire that prompted their emergence together. Oh. Bullshit. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, so when they put stuff out like that, isn't there a counter? Can't you do a counter? Well, that's what yeah. Vickery tells us about, yes. too, right? Yeah. We've got the counter. And were, yeah. um, were cattle and sheep put on those lands after the horses were Yeah. Ready? Well, West Douglas was supposed to be a zeroed out area. Is it zeroed out now? Because of the sheep ranchers there. Oh. Yeah. So there, there weren't supposed to be any horses there at all, uh -huh. according to what they determined years ago. You've all heard that 50% of the horse HMAs have been taken yep. away from them since the act. Yeah. This was one of those things. How long? How long were the horses? How long have those horses been there? Because they only started getting sick what a week, a little over a week ago. Have they? When were they? Eight months. They've been. Oh. Okay. So yeah. Yeah. You think that if they came in in un unhealthy conditions, they might have gotten sick in a few weeks, not eight months. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't have been able to run eight 10, months. 20 miles. This, this roundup was in September. No, I, I'm going to call both of these guys though. Mm -hmm. Outright lies, right? Paul's Valley off-range corral. This is a is a, an off-range corral in Oklahoma, and it's actually much bigger than most of them. We saw that the Boise one was 2.3 acres, right? This one uh, it serves as a resting point for animals arriving from the west. From here, they are shipped to adoption locations throughout the central and eastern United States. So when you hear of, of BLM sales and adoption events in the east or the Midwest, many of them come from Paul's Valley. It's in Oklahoma. They have 12 pastures on 400 acres of land with a maximum of 600 animals. So you can see they have a lot more room at this facility. And in Oklahoma, it, it, it's just a, a little bit different because in Oklahoma there's there's better grass and stuff, but of course there's still there they do have pasture here, so there is grass that they can not enough to sustain them, of course, but enough for them to at least wander around and pretend to graze <laughs> while they get their hay run out. But anyway, they have a, according to the BLM, they have a drive up interpretation center near the pastures that allows visitors to view. Adoptions are held on site at the facility the second Tuesday of each month from 10 a.m. to noon. A mixed group of 70 to 80 animals are offered at each adoption, often including burros and young horses. If you want to visit their facility and look to adopt, you, you give them a call and get your approval process going. All untrained animals are eligible for the $1,000 financial incentives through the AIP. And this facility is 45 miles south of Oklahoma City. So that's one of the better ones, right? Now you've all heard about the new New for the new facility that's proposed near Winnemucca. Uh, many of us wrote in our comments about how horrific this was. Uh, this, and even though we all wrote in our comments, it, it's no longer proposed. It's been approved. So this is what they have approved. 4,000 horses confined on 100 acres of dry lot pens. 40 horses mm. per acre. Mm. That's, it's, it's a feed lot. Yeah. The pen, this is in, this is in Nevada. what they proposed. Pens to be cleaned two to four yeah. times <coughs> per <coughs> year. 40 horses an acre cleaning two to four times. This has been approved. 
Um, is this a private, like a contracted facility? Yes. Okay. Yes. And it's going to be uploaded. Exactly. Mm -hmm. The waste buildup conducive to the spread of diseases and infections. Can you imagine if what's happening at Canyon City happening in these kind of conditions? Crowding so many animals together creates injury situations as well. And again, no shelter other than the special care pens uh, in this harsh climate of intense heat, wind, cold, precipitation of all types. It is a privately held facility off limits. How much are they getting paid for this facility? Yeah, so well, so probably a public lawyer request for that. So well, even so, that's against, uh, um, you know, uh, all the, uh, if you were to have an animal on your own property, it oh, goes right. all against that. Right. Do as we my, say, not as we do. My In my state, Colorado, we're only allowed four four horses per acre. Right. And even that's way too much. No, and you, you got to clean. You got to yes. clean. <laughs> yes. The, the facility is owned by a subsidiary of Simplot. Of course. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they have their fingers in everything, don't they? Yeah. Simplot, yeah. Coutures. Could you not figure out what they're going to get paid for by that free one to three dollars and five cents a horse per uh, day? Some of the Nine, short 4, term. Yeah, yeah. Some I of them mean, are five dollars a day. The five dollars short yeah. term is usually. I think short term. The long term is three a day or yeah. something like that. Yeah, the short term. Short term. Is five. So it's it's a lot of money. Yeah. So uh, the next thing I'm going to show is just my, an example of my comment letter that I sent in to the BLM about this. And we don't have time to go through it all, but I brought up several points that, that are just obvious to us horse people. But I, I have a, co a copy of my comment letter back there if anybody wants to see it. So it was like a two-page deal. Now we're going to talk about long-term <coughs> holding. This is what the BLM term calls off-range pastures. Doesn't that sound nice? Yeah. So off-range pastures, again, these, these cattle companies and people are making a fortune off of these, even though the per dollar amount per horse per day isn't as much as the short-term holding. Short-term holding, they, um, they don't get paid, they get paid more, but for these, they're still making millions of dollars. These are, the horses that go to long-term holding are supposedly the horses that are not adoptable, uh, that nobody wants. Um, they're sale authority horses, we'll go over that in a minute, but they're also, the, they're horses that are 10 years or older, or horses that are not as pretty as some others, or the, whoever the BLM deems are not adoptable, which also includes the three striped horse, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But um, they're gonna eventually, and that's the other term, eventually, how long are they stuck in those nasty pens? Uh, they're eventually sent to these long-term holdings. The off-range pastures have more than 35,000 horses that are still protected by the Act. So they're supposed to be protected from slaughter or sale to slaughter or that sort of thing. So they're still federally protected. They are located on private land that the BLM has contracted for. They, the, the contractor must have the ability to provide for a minimum of 500 horses and meet certain criteria for pens, fences, land, and water. Um, uh, so in other words, if you're not a gigantic landowner that can hold 500 horses, you can't say, I'll, I'll save these 10 on my 100 acres. Will you pay me? No, it's only the big shots. The guys with lots and lots of land. Um, they have to go through a competitive bidding process. So you think any of any little guys are going to win that? Um, it, the the off-range pastures are single gender. There's no families 
anymore. They're either geldings or mares. Some mares arrive already pregnant. Colts are weaned before they get big enough to start breeding and sent back with BLM for placement elsewhere. Or BLM pays them per horse per day at the end of every month. The BLM claims they regularly monitor and oversee wild horses and these or with annual inspections, but how do we know? No transparency, no public records. I'm going to give you an example of an off-range pasture next. Drummond Ranch. Anybody heard of the Pioneer Woman? Yeah, yeah we sure have. Yeah. Oh, she's a chairman, isn't she? Yeah. This is a cattle ranch located in Osage County, Oklahoma. Pioneer woman blogger and online personality, Ree Drummond. In 2016, the Land Report ran an article stating that the Drummond family is the 23rd largest landowner in the United States, 433,000 acres of property. Yeah, us little guys really have a chance. The article also reported the government paid the family $23.9 million for the wild horses' care between 2006 and 2016. Oh, that's, uh, what, $2.4 million a year? The 2011 article by Oklahoma News reported the government pays Lad Drummond husband, Reed husband, $1.30 per horse per day, which comes out to $1.04 million annually for he and his wife, Reed, but there were 34,000 horses between Lad Drummond and his brother in 2012, which comes to $4,420 per day and $1.6 million for that year. There's no public statistics on acreage available for the horses or acres per horse. They run cattle on their 433,000 acres. How much do they give to the horses? How much of that 433,000 is needed and how much is BLM? It's, it's their land. It's all needed. It's all, and that's why there's no public access. There's no transparency. Once a horse goes to long-term holding, or a public uh, for, or an off-range pasture, they're lost to the system. We have anything to hand off to those horses, and nobody has any idea. Nothing. I mean, they could go out and shoot them and say they still have them. We don't know. But because yes, BLM is supposed to oversee it and, and inspect every year, but there's no records. We don't know. Has BLM ever lied to us? <laughs> Did, do they also have um, leases on public land, this family? No. No. This is, they own, they, they own, wait, own their own land. They, they've been there for generations. They came in said, Native Americans, we want your land. Goodbye. <laughs> but you will see that in, in smaller states like Wyoming, 90% of that 433 will be public. That's how they get away with And the 10% will be deeded. Yeah. And that's the checkerboard area yeah. where the ranchers have all the power, but that's another story. Yeah. 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 That's where the ranchers have the power and they kick the horses off the public land because they refuse to put up fences and the horses get on their land and they say, come get them. Can you just yeah. clarify for me? So I'm not familiar with all this. My question is if they're restricting access to Roundup, so if they're on public lands, during roundups, I'm curious why they can restrict safety. access. Safety. Safety. Well, that's what they claim. Okay. Right. And then also, also for these, a, a couple slides back, you said that there's, if, if they're in long-term holding, if I'm remembering correctly, they're still federally protected. Yes. So if they're on private land and they're still federally protected, how come nobody has 
together and they stick together, even though they're all building. So could they be adopted or no? Not the not these. The, the, the ones that they bring in, the yearlings and the young ones that they bring in for certain adoption events can kind of take the kids out. But you can see the beautiful fairy knots when not they're still wild. And this is from the interpretation center, the visitor center, where they talk about the native American culture. The Ogallala Sioux are typically a tribe that does revered horses. There are others that don't. And just to get this is the brave buffalo song that kind of touched me, friend. My horse flies like a bird as it runs. Deerwood Ranch. This is the crown jewel of the pork system. Uh, it's a 4,700 acre ranch in the Centennial Valley, west of Laramie, Wyoming. It was previously a cattle ranch. This guy decided, oh, cattle are a lot of work. Maybe I can get paid by having these horses yeah. here and not have to work so hard. So he, it does provide a natural bull, and there's 350 wild horses there that have been gathered from throughout the western US. They hold the adoption and sale events throughout the year. The family owned operation by Rich and Janet Wilson, and I spoke with them when I was there. There's opportunities for the public to even stay on site or hold conferences. They have a little clip there. So they've made a nice little business out of this by not raising their cattle. And having and, and he told me it's a lot less work. We don't have to do anything. These guys, except in the winter, maybe sometimes come to us when they have to stand. And it's near Laramie. And this is the entrance to it. You get an idea of the, the scope of it. And these are the, this is the area for the yearlings. They were getting ready for adoption. They happened to have some when I was there. And there they are. These are the ones that you can adopt. And they're cute little babies. And then back out on the range. This is, you can see they have a, they really have a wide expanse of area to cover. And these are the beautiful horses. We were taken out there in a truck, uh, on the back of a truck, a flatbed type with rails, and we were allowed to get off here and wander around these horses. But you can see the wide expanse they have. There's no fences here. So here are the big group. Here's a big group out here. They have a lot of room. Beautiful horses. A lot of room. There's some of the tourists, the visitors that got off the truck to walk around. And the horses just kind of come up and look at you. You're not allowed to feed them, of course. But, they, but they're used to people. And now this is a little video I did about this, I'll play it, about these corpse. Again, it is single gender. They either have all bears or all geldings. It's not ideal. Before they get to the corpse, right? These are not horses going to a port. These are from a sale. Now, this is the port. Is there a way to keep the stallion stallion? 
Texas ranchers use their own land. Aren't they mad about these guys that are on the dole and getting all this cheap grazing for free? And he goes, I guess they don't want to know about it or understand it or what. He didn't he had no answer. No answer. And this is a college professor who teaches these ranchers how to preserve their own land. When I was in college there, we learned how to protect the land, how to rotate, how to do everything necessary. Do you think these guys are saying, oh, I don't care about that, I don't care. Um, anyway, these were not horses that came from well-known herds, so it was a simple adoption. There's a, we're gonna see the difference between a simple adoption and <coughs> a, uh, an auction like sand wash. So the horses and burros that this came, uh, event came from, uh, let me talk about that. So the ranchers from surrounding areas came. The burros at this event went quickly, unlike the burros in something we saw yesterday that were being sold for the burro train uh, and they were going to slaughter. These burros <coughs> were taken by ranchers. Oh boy, I get a $25 burro. Who's gonna go out and protect my burro? The burros are guard animals. They protect the sheep especially. Um, and he told me that about half of these were adopted to the AFP and half were purchased outright. Some ranchers just don't want the hassle. They don't want somebody coming in and saying, oh, do you have the right property? Do you have this, do you have that? And you'll get title in a year and for $1,000, they'd rather just skip the $1,000, pay 25 and leave. So he told me it was ha about half and half, and this was when the adoption incentive program had just started. This was a newspaper uh, announcing the event. This was uh, in Fort Stockton, Texas, and we'll just quickly go through these photos just to show the conditions. This was an indoor event, so they just set up these pens. So again, first come, first serve. The, the early bird gets the worm. Whoever gets there first gets their first choice. Some of these some of these animals have beautiful conformation. Nice horses. And the yearlings all crowding in the corner, getting away from the scary people. These are some of the signs that they put out about the adoption and set up the program, how they adopt. to get them away. This was a Texas loading video that you kind of saw part of. Oh, I didn't mean to play it. I wanted to go past it. Oh, these are the pictures that haunt me. Uh, keep me up at night. Look at his eyes and his face. It, it, it's just really hard. When you, when you go through taking these pictures, you're kind of in recorder mode and you block everything out. You go back and look at them and you dissolve. This horse is saying, what's happening? Who's, how can I get help? Where can I find help? And they're loading through the chute and off they go. This is a little te West Texas humor. Watch, Watch out, out for rattlesnakes. <laughs> I'm the ladies to rest her for a while. <laughs> Having gone to college West Texas, I understand. Uh, this is an adoption, this is a sand wash adoption sale bed. It's very different from the Texas one where you go in and say, I want that one, pay your 25. These are famous horses known all over the country, known all over the world because of Picasso and the strong advocacy team that they have. Um, this, these are the horses that are still in Canyon City right now, but this this was the first 76 of them who escaped to this adoption sale event. Um, we're just, we, we'll just quickly get through here. This is, this is what it looks like from afar. Oh, I didn't want to play it. This is just kind of showing you a, a video of these pens. There's more back here that you can't see. And this is 
Michelangelo Cenci, Michelangelo was the four-year-old son of Picasso. Mm -hmm. uh, here he is right here, Pinto. He's a number now. <coughs> and there he is, four-year-old baby of Picasso. But didn't all these horses get adopted? Is that what I read? Yeah. All these got yeah, adopted quite a because they're of famous. Of money. They're yeah. well-known horses, and they have a strong advocacy. That hooks out to they the were really adopted. Do you have the percentage of adoption per horses rounded up? I mean, total. It's very like small. Three percent. It's very small. When you consider last year, they had their most successful adoption rate ever because of the AIP program. They still only adopted out of what eight thousand horses, something like that, out of the eighteen thousand they brought in, and that's their highest percentage. Usually, it, they, it's in the low thousands how many are adopted up. So, oh, this is Cole's pen. Cole was another famous sand wash basin horse. He was famous for saving some babies. And then this is Kenyon. Um, these are, just quickly go through these. This is the mayor Comet who jumped the fence twice while they were trying to load up their shoes. She got out. I've got a video of that. Uh, go get her. These are some babies, tired babies. Bidding sheets here all along the fence. So you could see this is a bidding sheet for a popular little yearling. You can see that they had these ropes all up around the perimeter of the actual pen so that we couldn't get up to the pen and get too close to the horses. We had to stay behind these ropes. The bid sheets, the bid sheet, this is, here's our guy, Steve Leonard, explaining how the process was going to go after loading. Uh, I'm not going to have, I'm not going to play that video. This is a, uh, these are, these are the chutes where they ran the horses into, uh, and there were three of them stacked up here, and then some, you'll see that somebody, uh, they get scared in the chutes, and then Ginger, you still got 20 minutes, so if you want oh, to slow down a little okay. bit. Yeah, I'm trying to go through so fast. Yeah, I know. Okay. So, Are you not going to do yours? It's it's 20 to 12, so I'd rather Ginger just use her. Okay. Uh, this, is, this is the loading process, as most of you probably heard. The mayor Stormy died during this process. I uh, did about 20 feet away. This is the process where they're removing the tags because when the people adopt them, they know they're wild horses. They're not going to be able to get close to them, so they ask the BLM to take their tags off. So they have to put them in these chutes before 
they can they can uh, load them. So this these guys up here were trying to be as gentle as possible and, and trying to reach the tank to where they could cut it off. Scared. This is a family show. 
we met there. The, the adopted three were the mom and dad and a little girl. And they were just, they were going to be good, good people. This one might be the one that was a little bit more difficult loading. Put in pressure. So 
you see, he did not slam that gate on that door. He's gaping. He does not. These, these are these are BLM people who actually do give a little bit of a damn. They what? Yes, yes, and SWAT. You're right. SWAT is there. People who care are there. So this is the SWAT report on the Florence adoption event. Uh, you can get them on get, get this on their Facebook page when they talked about how all the horses were adopted and who they went to for for the, the most part and who to thank. Then we have the adoption incentive program. Probably everybody knows yeah. enough about that. We don't need to talk about this. It was Claire Staples at Sky Dog who first discovered the the paper trail of this. Then AWHC got on board, and then the New York Times expose caused the uproar. Online auctions, this is the online corral. It was developed to provide another resource. Um, they must be submitted ahead of time, and then you can track your, the status. But for a list, you go to this uh, link on the BLM site, and you can see the animals in their gallery. Private auction facilities, kill pen, buyers, kill, and various horse auctions are attended by kill buyers. Um, Pam True was going around the Florence event at Sandwash saying, there's kill buyers here. Like a kill buyer is gonna go to an auction where horses are going for a 14 month or something. So <laughs> I, I don't think so, <laughs> but that's the kind of misinformation you have to always watch out for. So the larger kill auctions will have kill, uh, the larger auctions will have kill buyers. The smaller auctions will have dealers who go from auction to auction to pick up enough horses to fill for a, a trailer load to take across the border. Rescues will attend both types of auctions. Kill buyers put a bottom on the market, so often horses are cheaper at the smaller auctions where kill buyers are not in attendance, so they can have a, a slip. Uh, some auctions sell horses by the pound, which is a clear indication of where they're going. <coughs> um, kill buyers must satisfy their contracts. They have contracts with these, with these facilities across the border of how many horses they must bring in. So they go to these auctions trying to fill their numbers. Uh, <coughs> they're willing to pay depend on the number of horses they need for their contract. Um, sometimes they'll bid higher and outbid a, a, a legitimate adopter. Um, some kill buyers are willing to work with rescues because that's an easy dollar, right? The rescue will say, I, I want to buy this horse from you, and they get more than they would from the kill the, 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 the slaughter facility. So the horses either ship directly from the auction to the slaughterhouse or to the kill buyer's kill pen where he can then try and sell them to the horse rescue or then on to the slaughterhouse or to the feedlot facility. Some rescues visit the kill pens and buy the horses before they're shipped. This I just found, uh, there, are, there are rescue sites online where they say, this came with a post, can anyone in Texas save this Mustang? And it's Elkhart Horse Auctions, halfway between Dallas and West Houston. You find these on Facebook all the time. Yep. All the time. And if we want to save those, we want to know it. Don't do it. Um, ship to slaughter. When that's shipped to slaughter, they come directly from auction, from kill pen, indirectly from owner to kill buyer auctions. Burrows, lesser known, we've talked about this, how is this pronounced? Egil. Egil. Horses are being, I mean, burrows are being slaughtered in huge numbers due to the growing demand for Egil, gelatin made from boiling donkey hides. 4.8 million donkey hides every year are used by the Egil industry. And only behind China and Hong Kong is the third largest importer of products contained in this. 
is gelatin used in food and so forth, right? Like used in what? Used in food. You go in the store and you buy the box. Well, of it's or is it different? it's yeah. much. Uh, it's used in cosmetics. It's used in traditional medicines. Uh, and again, uh, much like wet markets, it's a touchy cultural issue because of the cultural impacts of mostly Asian type communities who believe this stuff is medicinal or traditional. Uh, H.R. 5203 was introduced into the House by Rep. Don Beyer of Virginia. It would ban the sale and trade of the geo products in the U.S. That would be a big problem. So go for it, help for it, help that bill too. The lucky ones. We've seen all the horrible things of whichever track these horses end up on. There are some, some good ones to individual good home adopters. Some individual adopters are not good. Tip trainer, good one because some are not good. Sanctuary, good one because some are not good. So you've got to research any sanctuary that you want to help out. Herds that have very active and caring advocates who work to protect the herd. If they are rounded up and make sure they're all adopted, are so important. There are very few herd areas that have such active volunteers that they look after these horses from birth to whatever. And here are three examples. The Anaki HMA herd outside of Salt Lake City. Jen Rogers and her Red Birch Trust. You heard Scott talking about them. Then there's the Sandwash Basin HMA in Northwest Colorado. The Sandwash Advocate Team, which we're calling SWAT. The Great Escape Mustang Sanctuary, GEM. And then there's a, another organization called Wild Horse Warriors for Sandwash Basin. So all of those groups really work to help protect the Sandwash horses, which is why they were all adopted at that event and why they're all so nervous right now about what's going on in Kansas City. Then there's the Fish Springs HA. They're not an HMA. They had their land taken away from them, part of that 50% that's just gone now, but there's still horses out there, so they're calling it an HMA, HA instead of an HMA, and those advocates work tirelessly for these horses because they have less protection on an HA. It's near Gardner, Nevada, <laughs> And two of their organizations are called the Pine Nut Wild Horse Advocates, and then the other one is the Fish Springs Wild Horse Advocates. These are Fish Springs horses. I've been out to this herd many times. This herd and the prior herd are just, I can go back and back and back all the time. So there's good private adopters, so I'm just going to show you one example here real quick. The life of Rambo. Rambo is the son of Picasso and his beloved mayor, Mingo. Mingo's in, Mingo's in Canyon City right now, by the way. People are worried about it. So Rambo is the son of Picasso and Mingo. He was rounded up from Sandwash Basin in November of 2016. It was a bait trap. They didn't use helicopters. What a concept. About 50 young horses were removed. He came up for adoption in the spring of 2017. Here is baby Rambo with his daddy Picasso. Isn't that a beautiful picture? And here's young Rambo with Mama Mingo and Papa Picasso out on the range. Debbie, De Debbie Gonzalez, who was with me earlier this week, we had to leave, called this photographer and asked him, can you show your picture? Because <laughs> it's copyrighted. And he said, of course. And then here's Rambo on, right before he was rounded up. He was almost four. And here's Rambo now with his trainer. He's learning about what's this thing. And uh, Rambo on a training ride. Debbie lives in Colorado Springs. And so that's where she keeps Rambo. Here he is at home. So that's one of the good adoption stories. She loves that horse so much that she sent me to, to Florence to the sale of it to make sure his sister was okay, right? Uh, then there are good sanctuaries. Everybody knows about Sky Dog and, and 
Lord Canyon and others. Then there's Disappointment Valley. Uh, it's the smaller sister sanctuary of Angler Canyon. It's in the southwest corner of Colorado. Uh, so I went out there to visit. This is TJ Holmes. Uh, she oversees Disappointment Valley Wild Horse Sanctuary, which is also a sub subsidiary of the Serengeti Foundation. And so this is her job. She, she, she takes care of these animals. Uh, she doesn't take care of them. She just oversees, makes sure there's no problem. They, they have enough food out here. She doesn't have to feed them. Uh, TJ is a wonderful advocate and she works tirelessly not only for these horse, horses at the sanctuary, she also works tirelessly and is, works with the horses in Spring Creek Basin HMA in Southwest Colorado. And just a quick story, there are good BLM people. There are good BLM people. TJ loves her local BLM guys. They worked with her all summer long, many months, probably about six months, to put in two gigantic water catchment systems just last year. And they finished it right before the big rains came, and now these horses have water year round. She loves her BLM guys. She gets along great with them. And, and we just have to understand, not all BLM guys are bad. And most of them at the top, <laughs> <laughs> but but there are some good local ones and she loves her. These are these are just some of the horses at Disappointment Valley Sanctuary. And then Disappointment Valley is next to Spring Creek Basin, which I told you TJ also works with. And these three young mares actually came from Sandwash Basin. Do you know why? We're not supposed to talk about PCP, but TJ does PCP in, and this is one of those cases where it's just a tool in the toolbox <coughs> or an option for certain herds in certain situations. Mm -hmm. It's not for everybody. It's not for everything. It's just a tool, but it's needed in Spring Creek Basin because it's a small herd and they have to protect genetic viability. And TJ does starting with PCP. And you know how you always hear PCP doesn't stop roundups? In this case of Spring Creek Basin, they increased her AML because of the status quo, keeping the status quo of that herd, not expanding it up and out. So they increased her AML, and they got these three from Sandwatch. When a horse is shot with his PCP, yes. how do you know that horse was they, uh, that's a whole other subject, and I've gone through the PCP training at the Science and Conservation Center and been out with darters. It's, it's a whole other story that we don't have time for. I'll be happy to talk to you about that later. Okay. But they're very careful. They shoot the dart. They no. go find that dart. They don't want that dart laying on No, them. I understand. But how do they know which horses were darted? They document. They document started. everything. They so have they a database. Know. There's a database yeah, called Whip. Everything is documented. We can talk about that later because it's not a subject of this conference. Okay. I just wanted to bring up the fact that it does work in certain cases where it is necessary. She was, uh, so she was able to get these three mares from San Wash Basin and take them to the herd in Spring Creek Basin. And this young bachelor stallion decided, oh, the pretty young girls, I'll take them. <laughs> <laughs> then we have the Pine Nut Wild Horse Advocates. I'm almost done, guys, I'm hurrying. Um, and this is, they post this on their website. This is what they do and this is what they don't do. They work tirelessly for these animals in the Gardnerville, Nevada area. These are called the Fish Springs horses, but the but the main group is the Pine Nut Wild Horse Advocates. And I, I've met with these people many times. They're wonderful people. The horses, if you follow their stories online, you get wonderful stories of, of family band behavior 
all of the behaviors that the well horses have, and and it's just a constant education process for you. If you want to understand wild birds, you can find it on this website for the Climate Well Horse Adaptation. And this is some of the stuff that they promote in their community. This is this is Mary who took those those beautiful pictures over here of the stallion fight and the, and the fucking horrible stuff in the, in the Palomino Valley facility. So this is Mary, and they get the support of their county commissioners, and, and, and the whole community protects these horses, except for the very few who say, get them out of my yard, but they refuse to put up a fence. And then they post these everywhere, everywhere. And I, I was out there five or six years ago where they had a community meeting with their local BLM guy. And one guy kept saying, but I like seeing the horses. I'm gonna put out my, my hay. I like seeing them come into my yard. And they could not convince that guy. And then what happens years later? They come in and trap 21 of them, of their beloved small birds gone. So again, if you have a very active and involved advocacy group or community, you can really help these horses. So, sorry, I, did I run over? <laughs> Thank you very much, okay. Jennifer. You guys are on lunch break till one. Um, I do have a 12.30 phone call with my representative that Scott, I think, is going to hang out and help me out with. But if anybody else wants to watch, you're welcome to. Otherwise, you can take off and come back at 1 o'clock. Okay. Well, we are going to do Val's presentation for it runs about 55 minutes. Um, and then Jim Brown showed up yesterday. So he's going to share all with all of us about the Lander Complex in Wyoming. And then I might squeeze in my presentation for about 30 minutes, and then I'm going to do the one on Angler Canyon that I talked about. So hopefully we'll be done by 3.40, absolutely by 4 o'clock, so that we can set up for the art show this evening. Okay? And also, everybody, did you already mention yes. the raffle tickets this morning? Yeah, I did. So anybody who came in late, we are raffling off those two photos there. If you go to saveourwildhorses.net, click on raffle tickets at the top of the page, or if you're on your cell phone under the menu button, $10 a raffle ticket. You can get as many as you want. The photo on the right is mine from McCulloch Peaks. The photo on the left is Sandy Sharkey photography. She's based out of Calgary, but that photo was taken here. I apologize, I don't remember which herd. Um, they're both uh, canvas prints, both worth more than $350. So we're going to draw those names tonight during the art show. Wow. I am the ghost and the They call me Mariah. I have one question. Okay. <laughs> um, Yeah, exactly. I love you. Thank you. It's very nice meeting you. They need to be. 